Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to this Journal Club stream. My name is Robert Palgrave. I am delighted that you've decided to join us today. Whether you're watching live on Twitch, whether you're watching on uh, afterwards on YouTube or afterwards on Twitch, thanks so much for joining this stream today. Um, it's great to have you here. So, um, as I said, this is Journal Club. My name is Robert Palgrave. Um, many of you may already know what Journal Club is, but for those of you who don't, for those of you who may be uh, seeing the stream for the first time, um, what Journal Club is, is a place on Twitch where we can discuss uh, scientific articles, scientific journal articles. So uh, journals are kind of like magazines, publications, where scientists talk to each other. Um, they write up articles, which are the results of their experiments um, and investigations, and then they share them with other, uh, with other scientists. Um, and what we do in Journal Club is read an article and uh, discuss some of the ideas around it, discuss some of the science around it. Um, the reason we do it on Twitch is so that every, everybody in the world can get involved um, if they would like to. Might be a bit unmanageable in the chat, uh, but that's, that's, the, that's the goal, getting everyone involved um, in doing some discussion of, of scientific articles. Um, and for that reason, the articles that we choose are always what's called open access. So that means that anybody can, can go and look at these articles, can read these articles for free. Uh, many scientific articles, that's not the case. You have to pay money, sometimes quite a lot of money, uh, to read these articles. But the ones that we choose are all going to be open access. It means that anyone can uh, click on the link and um, read the article for themselves. But how do you get the link? I hear you all screaming. How do you get hold of the link? Well, luckily for you, we have uh, a chatbot in the chat. And if you ask the chatbot nicely, and to do that, you type exclamation mark and then you type the word paper. Um, and again, when you do that, which I've just tried, you know what, I'm gonna try, I'm just gonna do the same thing again. I think maybe chatbot is a little bit slow. What chatbot's done is given the, uh... no, chatbot's not saying anything at all. If you type exclamation mark and paper, then you should get a, um, a link to the current paper. But for some reason, for some reason, today and the last time we did the stream, Chatbot decided not to do that. It had its own ideas. Uh, and it actually gave us the, the link from last last week's paper, not last week, on mon last stream's paper, which was on Monday. So I'm at the moment having a little word with Chatbot um, to find out what on earth he's doing. So you know what, Chatbot should be Chatbot should be working. Let me let me try one more time. Exclamation mark paper. Let's see. There we go. I think he gets a bit nervous. It's understandable. At the start of the stream, he feels a bit nervous, um, but he's 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 come through for us. So this link here, the second link, not the first link. The first link was last week, like well, not last week on last stream Monday. So if you want to read last Monday's paper, go ahead, it's the first link there. Um, if you don't want to do that, if you want to read uh, this week's paper, probably more useful to you at the moment, then it's the second link. Uh, but both of them are open access. Have a click on those if you want to follow along on your own tab, but don't, don't leave this tab. That would be a mistake. Um, and you can you can access the paper there, but of course we're going to go we're going to go through it on screen as well. So you may not have to, just for your own information, really. You may want to follow up some of these points uh, uh, afterwards. Okay, so let's see what paper we are uh, looking at today. If you follow us on Twitter, there's a link for Twitter down below. If you're on Twitch, probably if you're on YouTube as well, who knows? Um, then you will know what paper we're going to discuss because it was tweeted out. And if you don't follow us on Twitter. Uh, I think you should probably uh, rectify that. But anyway, what paper are we discussing today? It's this paper. Uh, it's called Replicating Cyandra Opis Butterfly Structural Color for Bio-Inspired Bigrating Color Filters. So, uh, this is a paper which came out in Advanced Materials. You can't see that because my face is over the top of it, but if I scroll down, 
came out in Vice Materials uh, a few weeks ago, I think, not too long ago, for a new paper. Um, you can see the authors here, Jaibao Kao, Kao, I think maybe that's how you say it, uh, et al. Uh, it's the first author there. I think Andrew DeMello is the uh, uh, one of the senior authors. Um, so this paper, as you can see from the title, is about uh, structural colour and specifically a, a, a butterfly structural colour. Um, so before we get too too deep into the article, I'll um, maybe I'll say a few words about uh, about structural colour. I'm just going to set my volume level, change it a little bit. Hopefully that's a bit more uh, comfortable. Um, so. What is structural colour? Well, I think an interesting question um, for pretty much anyone to ask themselves is why are things coloured? Where does colour come from? So you look around where you are now, probably many objects around you have got colour. Could be a pen, could be the desk you're sitting at, could be the compu computer monitor, uh, the clothes you're wearing. All of these have Color. So, where does the color come from? How do, how how are things colored? Why are things colored? I think it's a pretty interesting question. Um, and it turns out there's different ways you can have color. There's not just one way you can have color. There's actually lots of different ways you can have color. So, um, some of the ways you can have color, uh, you can absorb light, which shines onto an object. So, if you're an object, if you have an object, it can absorb some of the light which shines onto it. So, as as everybody knows sunlight or white light is actually made up of a mixture of lots of different colors so there's loads of different colors color wavelengths in in white light and so if you shine white light onto a material and if it absorbs some of those colors but not other ones then the missing colors you won't see and the colors which aren't missing you will see so if it absorbs all of the red light for example then your material could look blue or green if it absorbs all the blue light your material will kind of look red or orange or yellow um, so your material a material can absorb color uh, it can absorb some color some light that's that's how it can appear colored another way a material can appear colored is if it gives off light so if it's if it's actually emitting its own light so of course the Sun is emitting its own light any light bulbs you have the uh, computer screen you are watching this on is, is emitting light um, and so if it emits light of a certain color, then it will look that color. So if it's shining, red light shining out, then it will look red, obviously. Um, so those are, the, those are the two main ways something can, can look colored. It can uh, absorb light or it can emit light. But there's actually lots of, lots of other ways that it can do those two things. So um, many, many materials around us which are uh, light absorbers so those are things which are not giving off their own light so that's most objects around you so most things around you are not giving off their own light so your clothes for example and well I don't know what most people's clothes let's say uh, do not actually emit light themselves they just uh, absorb light that, that falls onto them um, you know the, the desk in front of you the walls around you if you're inside maybe you're watching this outside if you're watching it outside the leaves the grass um, Everything, most things you see, you see around you are uh, absorbing light in a, in a particular way. So the way they're absorbing light um, is that the electrons within your material, the electrons which make up, which are part of the atoms within the material, um, can absorb some of that light and they can move to a different energy level. They can move to a higher energy level. So they take the energy that comes from the, uh, from the light that falls on them and they jump up to a, to a higher energy level. Um, so, so electrons actually interact very strongly with, with photons, they interact very strongly with light. Uh, so that's something that, that most of the colour you see around you, that, that's actually what's happening. There's electrons moving to different energy levels. Um, so when they move up to a higher energy level, they absorb that energy. What happens to that energy? Most of the time that energy just gets um, dissipated as heat. So the electron will kind of find its way back down to the, the lower energy level uh, and the, the, the energy that, that it absorbed is all just lost as heat, so the material gets hot. So this is kind of, you can understand, if you have a, a dark coloured object and a light coloured object and you put them both in the sun, then the dark coloured object tends to get warmer 
than the light colored object and that's for that reason it's absorbing more light and that the, the energy from that light is eventually being um, converted into into heat to make the material hot so that's the way that most materials absorb light and this is true for natural things so like um, the leaves you can see outside if you've got a window um, the, co the colors of plants and flowers most flowers uh, that, that's how that's how it works the the electrons are jumping up to our to a higher energy level and it's also true for artificial dyes so the artificial dyes that you might have on your clothes or in uh, the, the pen that you're writing writing down all my words with um, those artificial dyes will also you know work in the same way they will have a um, an electron which moves to a higher energy level and that corresponds to a particular wavelength of energy uh, and so that's the the, the color that's that's absorbed that's the, that's the uh, the wavelength that's absorbed um, but that's not the only way that you can have color so electrons moving around is, is the majority but it's not the only way there's actually a, a, another way and that way is used quite a lot in in nature uh, especially in animals animals tend to use this device quite a lot I think probably some plants as well I'm not an expert on on uh, the natural world in terms of plants and animals but uh, there may be some plants that have the same um, mechanism as well and this that mechanism is called structural color so structural color is where you don't have a dye you don't have a, a molecule or a substance which is absorbing light the reason that you get color is because of the the actual shape or the actual structure of the thing itself of the object itself so when we say structure and shape or in in uh, in this in this context anyway we're talking about structure which is on a very very small scale so the wavelength of light uh, of visible light is around um, half a micrometer a micrometer is a millionth of a meter it's okay, so about half a millionth of a meter uh, is um, the wavelength of, of visible light so that's the the kind of scale that kind of scale is where where we we're talking about the uh, the structure that we um, uh, that we need in our um, object in order to get what's called structural color. So if you have uh, structure on that scale, and we're going to see some examples of that in this paper um, from the natural world and artificial ones. If you can get structure on that scale, then you can actually cause lots of different effects, which end up resulting in color. And the quality of the color, the way that color looks, is kind of a, a bit different to the way that um, standard color words that you get with dyes, you know, with, with the, that we talked about at the beginning. So some, the, maybe the best way to, to understand that is to, to give some examples. So some examples of things in the natural world which have structural color are, um, well, the obvious example is butterfly wings, because we're looking at a paper kind of about that. So butterfly wings many butterfly wings the color from those actually comes from uh, some of it does come from dyes from pigments but um, in many cases it comes from structural color as well and you kind of get that kind of iridescent quality to the color it kind of shimmers a bit and when you look at it at different angles the color slightly changes and maybe even if you look at it with the light passing through from behind compared to reflecting from the front it might look completely different you don't normally get that with with pigments with with dyes uh, peacock feathers is another one so that kind of shimmery quality of peacock feathers um, fish scales I think have many fish scales have this uh, kind of structural color um, so it can produce very vivid colors and it can produce colors which change with the, the angle that you look at it um, so as the the object or the animal or whatever it is moves in front of you it's kind of got a very um, almost hypnotic quality to the uh, to, to the way it looks so the reason that it can do that the reason that the color looks different from different angles is because um, of, of the way the color is produced so the way the color is producing structural color there's a few different ways but for example it can produce be produced by uh, interference effects so interference effects um, are where you have light reflecting from different surfaces that are very close together and the light reflecting from one surface interferes with the light reflecting from another surface 
and causes uh, some of that light to be um, to be extinguished, to, to go away, to have, have kind of destructive um, interference and to disappear. And so only some of the light at certain wavelengths will, will be able to be uh, reflected from that, that surface. So a good example of that which I probably should have given before, is the example of a, an oil slick on the road. So many of you, probably everyone has seen a, an oil slick on the road. If, if some oil is spilled on, on the road outside, you get this kind of rainbow effect. Another, the, exactly the same effect is in a bubble. So a soap bubble. So imagine a bubble floating by, you can kind of see all the different colors swirling in it. The reason you get those colors is because the thickness of the bubble wall is about the same thickness as, a, um, as the wavelength of light. So it's approximately the same thickness. And so that means as the thickness kind of slightly changes as the bubble gets thinner and thinner, as the, the, the soap kind of flows around the outside of the bubble, um, the, the exact thickness corresponds to slightly different colors. So different colors are, light is able to reflect from the, the, one, one, the, the inside surface of the bubble and the outside surface of the bubble. And those surfaces are very, very close together. And when it reflects from those two surfaces, so you can get this interference. And that's what that's what results in the color. So um, the angle that you, you, you view it at depends, uh, will, will influence the, uh, the interference wavelength, the wavelength that, that's uh, able, you're able to see. So that's why the color will change as you, as you change your, your kind of viewing angle. Um, so the um, an, another way you could get structural color is something called diffraction. So diffraction is where light passes through or reflects off um, a regular arrangement of um, particles, objects, uh, something with a regular structure, something with translational symmetry. We could say so that this is the same as diffraction is used a lot in in different scientific fields, especially my scientific field in materials science. But it, it happens uh, with not only uh, x-rays as we use it in material science but also for uh, uh, it can also happen with visible light so as, as light passes through some periodic uh, arrangement like a grating like a diffraction grating then it can be split into um, if you shine white light through then it can be split into the different um, colors uh, similar not exactly the same but similar to light passing through a, a, a prism the famous kind of experiment of Isaac Newton the light passing through a prism um, which gets you, which splits the, the light up into um, in, into each of the different colors. That's not actually diffraction, that's a, a slightly different phenomenon. Uh, but another example of structural colors, that's another example of structural color. So the, the message really is that structural color uh, is um, very common in nature, quite common in nature, but most of the, the colors we see around us in kind of the, the man-made world actually are not structural color, they come from uh, normal dyes or from things emitting light um, but what the paper we're going to talk about today as we uh, let, let's move on to that the paper we're going to talk about today is about artificially creating structural color um, and this this whole idea of, of um, copying the biological world or bio inspired materials uh, so we look at how um, materials function in the natural world and we try to kind of replicate those because um, to be honest the materials that uh, are present in the natural world if we think about functional materials materials that do things whether we're talking about um, photosynthesis materials which absorb light and store it store energy from that light in a in a chemical form um, or whether we're talking about uh, uh, things that can replicate themselves so you know living things uh, self-repairing materials such as you know li living organisms are made of or whether we're talking about this kind of color th the natural world is is orders of magnitude ahead of what we can achieve um, through through designing materials ourselves and I don't think that's any any exaggeration there's the, the, the way that photosynthesis works in a leaf uh, the way that self-healing um, materials work in your, your skin or in uh, your bones is just beyond beyond the horizon really uh, of what we can do um, so that's in, in a sense that's kind of depressing because you think well we're, we're, our, our efforts are kind of weak compared to uh, what, what's evolved naturally in nature but it also means there's a lot more scope uh, for the materials that we make to improve there's a lot more scope for, for us to 
to make far far better materials far more powerful materials than we have at the moment um you know so that that's that should be a positive thing you know there's a lot there's a lot of uh, a lot of room for improvement and it's, it's difficult to imagine you know what what breakthroughs might um be accomplished if we if we can control materials and make materials in the same way with the same kind of power that uh that, that exist in nature already anyway so the idea of, of copying nature is is very widespread and that's what we're looking at today so this paper is going to be um, looking at these bio-inspired bi-grating color filters so i've kind of chatted away for a bit let's have a look at the uh let's have a look at the paper and we will start off by reading the uh the abstract so let's go through uh let me grab a pen so i can kind of randomly scribble on the paper um, multi-layer grating, grating structures such as those found on the wings of the butterfly a cyandria opis are able to interact with light to generate structural color coloration structural coloration okay this is the, the key concept here when illuminated and viewed at different angles such structural color is characterized by exceptional purity and brightness okay to, to provide further insight into the mechanism of structural color coloration two photon laser lithography is used to fabricate bio-inspired bio-grating and nanostructures whose optical properties may be controlled by variation of the height and period of the grating features through use of both spectral measurements and finite element method simulations here in specific feature dimensions are identified that due to combined effects of multi-layer interference and diffraction generate excellent spectral characteristics and high color purity over the entire visible range additionally it's demonstrated that the variation of feature period and or height plays a central role in controlling both the hue and purity of the color. Uh, importantly, such tunable bi-grating structures are a significant utility in color filtering applications. Okay, so I think maybe we will spend a bit of time on the on the introduction, I think. Uh, maybe maybe I'll look at it a bit because it, it kind of covers what we were just talking about and it's, it's kind of directly relevant. But I want to show you the pictures really because the pictures are, are kind of where it's at with this paper. So. Since Perkins' discovery of movine, so movine was the first uh, synthetic dye. Was it first synthetic dye? I, I, let's say yes, that makes sense, doesn't it? First synthetic dye in 1856. Actually, this happened just down the road from where I'm sitting at the moment uh, in West London. So not very far away. Um, uh, and one of the local schools is named after this guy. So since Perkins' discovery of movine in 1856, synthetic dyes have found... Uh, widespread use and application in almost all walks of modern life. Yeah, absolutely. Despite the utility, synthetic dyes are environmental damaging, environmentally damaging and limited in their brightness, purity and lifetime. So dyes, synthetic dyes, however good quality they are, eventually will fade, they will break down over time um, and they'll stop, they'll stop being as brightly coloured, they'll stop having the, the properties that they had before. Uh, so they, they can also be environmentally damaging, um, they don't have to be, but they can be. So to overcome such limitations, much recent activity has focused on generation of lasting colors via structural coloration, where color results from the interaction of visible light with periodic micro or nanostructures causing diffraction, interference or scattering. Yeah, that kind of sums up, as we often find in these streams, the authors managed to sum up what I've tried to waffle about um, in a much, a much shorter amount of time. So uh, exactly right. So that there, it's a completely different mechanism instead of these dyes, these pigments, where you're getting electrons being excited, and that's what absorbs the light. This is an interaction of the uh, visible light with some kind of periodic structure, some repeating structure on the nanoscale or on a microscale, about the same the same size as the uh, visible light itself, which produces the color. Structural color produced in such a manner is usually angle dependent, iridescent, and when compared to color produced by light absorption, is more vibrant, tunable, and stable. Okay, so we've, we've, I think, got the idea of what they're trying to do here. I want to show you the pictures, I think, first, because I think this is maybe the, uh, a good way to begin uh, kind of approaching this paper. So, as they, they're going to uh, explain in a, a section of the intro, we may or may not read. This is what happens if you look closely at the, uh, the wings of a particular... Uh, butterfly and this is I think applies to many butterflies and also many other creatures so peacocks is the other obvious one fish is the other one so you look very closely at the the wings here the zoomed in portion here this is a scanning electron microscope image I think um, and so this is 20 microns here so remember the wavelength of light is about half a micron 
is about half of my phone. Um, so the as you zoom in, you can see the uh, wings are made of these kind of scales, and each of these scales is made of up of these individual little stripes. And if you zoom in on the stripes, and now you can see that the scale here is two microns. So remember the the wavelength of light is probably about this this long on this scale. Yeah, that's about the wavelength of visible light. Um, so you can see that the the stripes actually are what's called these bigrating. So you have a uh, these kind of what are almost horizontal on the screen here. These horizontal stripes going almost left to right, and then kind of behind those or underneath those, you have these kind of up and down stripes, up and down struts. Um, and so it's this repeating unit, this this periodic structure. I mean, this doesn't even really look like a natural object, does it? To be honest, if you you zoom in on it. It looks like a very structured object. It looks like something that, that's made by humans, but this is a uh, this is the, the the color of these. Um, this is what the structure of these colored colorful butterfly wings. So you have these these kind of two layers of structure. You have these two gratings, one on top of each other, if you like. Um, and what what the uh, authors of this paper essentially did was to produce their own artificial version of these gratings. They had two planes. Uh, which which were placed on top of a, a substrate. So whoops. So the substrate is just the the underlying material to hold it up. I'm not doing very well at scrolling. There you go. The substrate is the underlying material which holds it up, and there's these two planes. And each of the planes have their own range of properties. So that each of these planes is a grating in in, in perpendicular direction, just like the um, just like we saw in the microscope image a while ago. And each of the planes has uh, a property. So it has a spacing between the layers, spacing between the, the grating, sorry, uh, so the periodicity, and it also has a height. So it has these, these kind of two um, independent properties, the, the size of the grating, so the spacing, and the height of the grating. So they were able to make um, these materials, and they were able to make materials with different values of D1, D2, which is the distance, the, the size of the grating, and H1, H2, which is the height of each individual layer. So, how on earth would they manage to do that? Because they have to do this not on a on a kind of big scale that we can see, but on a essentially a nanoscale or a micro scale. Um, so the values of D need to be in you know a small number of micrometers at the most. So how were they able to do this? Well, the the method that they used. Let's, let's zoom out again. So as as is quite common with these papers, the uh, the how they did it bit, the experimental is kind of at the end. Uh, so let's have a look at the experimental section. Um, fabrication of the bigrating structures. So bigrating structures are fa fabricated via two photon lithography using this photonic professional GT femtosecond laser lithography system. Okay, on a glass substrate. So the, um, the way that two photon uh, lithography works is that um, you you have a laser which is shone onto a um, what's called a photoresist. So the photoresist is something that will uh, change its properties when light is shone onto it. So it will change its properties when light is shone onto it. Um, and I think in this case, this is a uh, is it a positive or photo or negative photoresist? Uh, yeah. So the photoresist is solidified. By the laser, so where you shine the laser onto the photoresist, which is just a kind of plastic material, it will solidify uh, into into kind of a solid a solid plastic. Um, if you don't shine the laser onto a particular point, then it will stay kind of goopy, like liquidy. Yeah, so it starts off being liquid. You shine a laser onto it, wherever the laser hits, it will turn into a into a solid, basically. Now the thing about two photon. Um, lithography is a kind of special kind of lithography which allows you to have very very precise control on the spatial arrangement of the um, of, of the object that you're making so the way two photon lithography works is that the photoresist itself which is this, this kind of liquidy plasticky layer um, doesn't actually absorb the uh, doesn't actually absorb the laser light at all so if you just shine the laser normally through it it doesn't actually absorb any light, so it doesn't interact with the laser normally. Um, so how does that actually work then? So th the photoresist can only absorb the laser light if a particular molecule of it 
absorbs two photons at the same time. So both photons have to basically hit the same molecule. Two photons have to hit the same molecule at the same time in order to be absorbed and in order to, to convert the molecule into a, into a solid. Okay? So it's not just any, any laser light shining on. You have to get two photons being absorbed at the same time in the same molecule. Now, that's actually quite unlikely to happen. Even though we think of lasers as being very, very bright, um, actually it's quite unlikely that two photons are gonna be absorbed by the same molecule. But in fact, the, the probability of that happening um, increases as we increase the intensity of the, the laser. And it actually increases with the square of the intensity. Because we need two photons there, the, the probability of absorbing two photons increases with the square of the intensity. So if we increase, uh, so, so the way that the two photon lithography works is that we can actually focus the laser onto a specific point of the um, of the photoresist of, this, of, the, of the material that we're working with. So only at the focal point of the laser will the intensity be high enough for us to get um, two, for us to get a high chance of two photon absorption. So only at the focal point of the laser will the um, will the probability of two photon absorption be high enough that it actually happens quite a lot. You know. Uh, the rest of the space around it where the laser is passing through where it's not focused where it's defocused um, the chances will be very very low because the chances fall away it's a square of the intensity okay so it's not a linear it's called a non-linear optical material um, so the, the solidification works with by the the square of the, the material uh, square of the intensity so only at the focal point will the material become solidified but uh, we can control or they can control using their equipment they can control the focal point very very precisely of these lasers yeah so the they can be very very precise with the um, spatial arrangement of the the material that they're making they can make very very small features on a nanoscale on a micro scale uh, using this kind of um, using this kind of methodology so that essentially allows them using these femtosecond lasers so femtosecond is how long the laser pulses for so femto is uh, 10 to the minus 15. So 10 to the minus 15 seconds, or what's that? Is that a million billion, a million billionth of a second? Uh, it's a very, very short time that the, the laser is shining for, um, but it shines for that amount of time and only at the focal point will it actually cause the, the photoresist to solidify. And that's how they're able to produce um, structures which are uh, very, very similar to the structures found naturally. So going back to what I was saying before, you can see that the, the kind of contrast between um, man-made materials and, and natural materials. So the, the butterfly wings uh, are, are produced by the butterfly, are produced by these, these structures produced in the butterfly wing uh, just spontaneously um, in, in a kind of self-replicating fashion, self-repairing fashion, um, just by you, you know the the uh, the biological nature of the butterfly. Whereas to do this artificially, you have to have very advanced equipment, femtosecond lasers, very very short uh, laser pulses, non-linear optical materials, um, very very expensive system to to kind of build this up. And then even when you made it, you know it's not self-replicating, it's not self-healing like the butterfly is. So. Uh, a huge amount of expense and expertise and high technology goes into just reproducing one little part of the butterfly and there's so much else that the butterfly does uh, which we're not even not even close to so that's that's the kind of humbling part i think of of looking at these these bio inspired materials that's how i always uh kind of feel when you look at them uh when you when you look at uh, what what nature can do and, and we we kind of struggle to replicate even a part of it but anyway they have been able to replicate a part of it and they have been able to make these bi-grating feature where you have these two different uh, layers as i said before and they both have this this d1 d2 that's the spacing of each layer and h1 h2 that's the the height of each layer so um that's essentially how they made them now let's have a look at the uh let's have a look at the results so we can read a little bit from the results maybe so as previously noted, interference and diffraction can produce iridescent colors within structures possessing 3D periodicity. Yeah, so they talked about that in the introduction. Um, moreover, when diffraction is involved, coloration will be angle dependent over a narrow angle range. In the case of the male C. opis butterfly, 
deep blue colour is observed on specific regions of the wings, figure 1a. There we go. The specific regions of the wings there. Um, as revealed by scanning electron microscopy, SEM, imaging of these regions, figure 1bc, that's what we just looked at, the iridescent blue colour is produced by a crossed double grating like structure, i.e. a bigrating. Here, an array of ridges forms the first diffractive plane, plane 1, while the cross ribs below this plane form the second diffracting plane, plane 2. Such a structure formed by two orthogonal gratings can diffract light in both the x and y directions, so both lateral directions perpendicular to each other. Analysis of the SEM image in figure 1 and atomic force microscopy measurements indicate a period, D1, of 1.18 microns and a height, H1, of 2.1 microns for the upper grating. These values are approximately double those of the lower grating, where D2 is 0.63 and H2 is 0.98 uh, microns. Um, such an array consisting of both micro and nanostructures is a result of millions of years of evolution with structural modifications being responsible for colour variations between species. We used uh, simple bigrating structures found in C, uh, sorry, we simple, simplified bigrating structures, figure 1D, to mimic the cross double grating structures found in C opus wings. In all the testing configurations, the upper grating in plane 1 has a height of H1 and is periodic with a period of D1 in the X direction and uniform in the Y direction, whereas the lower grating has a height H2, is periodic with a period D2 in the y direction and uniform in the x direction. When white light is incident across a wedge of angles on a bi-grating structure, highly saturated coloration is observed at certain output angles due to the combined effects of interference and diffraction of figure 1e. Let's look at figure 1e. Figure 1e here. Yeah, okay, so they're saying you, you have both interference effects. So interference effects, remember what you get on um, soap, bubbles, soap bubbles or on oil slicks. Diffraction is what you get if you shine light through a diffraction grating. You may have seen one of these before. Um, and these, these effects are combining together. Uh, interference and diffraction combining together to give this, this coloration of this, uh, of this uh, artificial butterfly wing. Um, figure 1F shows a representative SEM image of a fabricated bigrating structure having D1 of 800 nanometers, D2 of 400 nanometers, so that's 0 0.8, 0 0.4 microns. The height profile of the bigrating structure so are assessed by AFM images uh, presenting figure S3. Okay, well, we, we maybe we'll look at that later. So as we saw before, this is the SEM of the artificial structure. It's not exactly the same as the natural structure, but it's pretty similar. There's not, not too much difference there. Okay, we next examine how variations both incident angle and geometrical characteristics of the bigrating structures could be used to generate bespoke structural color. Specifically, we consider the case uh, in which the orthogonal gratings share the same period and height and can be treated as a single layer grating. Okay. FEM simulations were performed to investigate the relationship between the period structure and the resulting uh, structural color spectra under different incident angles, 2A. Okay, so let's have a look at these. So are these... Uh... Okay, so I think these are actual, actual pictures. I think these are actual pictures. Structural colors generated for different periods. Uh, yeah, I think they are. So here they're uh, looking at different angles and uh, using the same uh, D spacing, so the same grating size on a, on both layers, on the top and bottom layer. And, and they're changing what that size is. So changing from 400 nanometers, 0.4 microns. That's quite a bit smaller than the butterfly. Up to around 1100, that's about the same size as the butterfly, I think. Uh, kind of the same, same size. And you can see the difference as you change angle. So when, when the when the D spacing is very small, that's much smaller than in, in nature, actually the angle doesn't really matter that much, the colour that you see. The colour's kind of you know orangey, yellowy orange on all of these. But however, as you increase and get much closer to the, the actual value found in nature, now you get a big variation when you when you look at different angles. So at zero degrees here it's kind of pink, but at 30 degrees it's gone blue. 45 degrees it's almost back to pink again and you can see different different kind of options as you as you uh, go through this so just by changing the, the spacing the diffraction grating spacing the D spacing here they're producing this very different um, color spectrum very different range of colors which in some cases for the higher D spacing give you very different uh, colors at different angles as well so that's pretty that's pretty interesting Okay, let's see what else we have in this figure. Um, 
B is simulating electron field distribution for the bi-grating structure. Okay, so they're simulating the interaction of light with the with the bi-grating structure um, and trying to understand where these colors come from. Um, and C is experimental transmission spectra between 300 and 800. So here you're looking at transmission spectra, so how much light is passing through the material and kind of linked up with, with, the, with the color here. Um, so again, you can see the color changing a lot with, with the, as the D spacing increases. And you can see why the color is changing because there's different absorption bands. So where the transmission is low, that means we're absorbing light. So we're absorbing light down at 400 uh, nanometers. So that's that's very blue light. And we're absorbing light in kind of uh, 600 to 800. And we're not absorbing much light at about 500. So 500 is a kind of green light. Uh, 400 is kind of blue light. Uh, between six and 800, we're getting onto um, kind of yellow and orange or red light in that region. And you can see these, these graphs, these absorption spectra change as you're, as you're changing the spacing. So that, that kind of explains why the, why the color is, uh, is different. Okay, so let's have a look. Uh, let's see what else I say. It can be seen by varying the instant angle between zero and 45, there was negligible color change um, for grating periods between 400 and 500. Yeah, that's what I mentioned. In contrast, for grating to a period above 600, uh, hue and purity are more sensitive to variations in the incident angle. For example, uh, for a grating period of 900 nanometers, the color is seen to change from light pink at zero to violet at 15, cyan at 30, and orange at 45. So that's 900 nanometers. Let's go look at that one. That's this one here, yeah. So this is this is maybe got the widest range of colors. Um, so imagine imagine that, you know, tilting in front of you. It would look, look pretty interesting, wouldn't it? Look very different to uh, pigment, pigment colors. Uh, for larger periods, the diffraction occurs at large incense angle and structures exhibit a strong violet color. In this regard, our results are in good agreement with the work of Brink and Lee, who noted that deviations in grating period with, between the C opus wings are the primary factors controlling spectral distribution of diffracted light. Okay. Um, to more closely investigate the relationship between grating height and structural color, we numerically simulated transmission spectra with two bi-grating structures having the same period but different grating heights, uh, where H1 is varied whilst keeping H2 constant, and that's shown in figure 3a. Let's have a look. Well, let's just see what they say. As expected, these simulations indicate, as expected, these simulations indicate that the color variations are height de dependent since two periodic structures form a lattice of diffracting elements. More specifically, figure 3b and c shows that increases in either H1 or H2, a constant H2 or H1 respectively, causes a primary spectral feat peak to shift to longer wavelengths as indicated by the dashed lines. Okay, let's have a little look at this. So now they're changing the height. So above they were changing the, the size of the grating. Now they're changing the height of the grating. Um, and again, we can see, I think this is simulated now. I don't think this is actually real data. Before we were, showing, we were looking at experimental um, spectral data, but at the moment we're looking at, uh, we're not, we're looking at uh, simulated. Um, but you can see the, the differences in color you would expect just by changing the height. Okay, so here we're changing height one, here we're changing height two. So height one seems to have a lot more effect. Height one is a top layer. Height one seems to have a lot more effect on the on the color than than, uh, than height two, I would say. So here you, you seem to get a bigger variety of colors. Here they're, they're more kind of pastel aren't they? Kind of orange. Orange and, and dusty pink, whereas here you get a really vibrant red there and, and really, really bright yellow colors as well. Okay. Influence of the period ratio D1 to D2. So now they're going to look at, okay, what happens if we make D1 and D2 different sizes to each other? So before they've always been the same size. This is the size of the grating. Now they're going to change them to make to make them different sizes. So to investigate the relationship between a period ratio D1 to D2 and structural color, we systematically varied ratio D1 and D2 between one to one, ratio one to one, so the same, and three to one. Again, it gives the ratio set. Whilst keeping the grating heights fixed, so figure 4a displays both the structural and simulated spectra, so both the experimental and simulated spectra, and associated bi-grating color images for five different period ratios. Okay, so let's look at this. So here's a different ratio. So here's one to one um, simulation measurement. And here's one and a half to one, two to one, two and a half to one, and three to one. So we're getting, again, big changes here as you're changing the, the ratio. And pretty impressively, the uh, simulation is matching up pretty well with the 
uh, with the actual experiment, considering they have to make these things, they have to fabricate these things using this two photon lithography process that we talked about. Um, you know, pretty good agreement there with, with, their, with their model. Um, and again, a lot, a lot of control over the color that you're getting. Um, so by changing the height, by changing the ratio, you're able to um, exert a lot of influence over the, the color. So this is, this is kind of to sum it up really, influence of the height ratio. So they also did the same with the height ratio here. You get you know, a similar kind of effect, big changes in, in the color there. Um, and now I think they're, so B is B. Okay, so they're, they're using this, um, this is a, a CIE chart. So this is kind of a, a, a one way of representing color in these, these kind of two dimensions, these X and Y. I think you have a third dimension as well. I can't remember what the, I did used to know that, but I can't remember what it is. Um, but you can see that the kind of path that you can take um, as you as you keep the um, height ratios, as you pick a certain height ratio, but change the uh, the height one of those what those heights are. So if you keep the same height ratio, you kind of go in a spiral. You go in this kind of circle um, what, as you change the height. So this this is the kind of space that you can control your your colors in. I think they have another one of these down here as well. Yeah, so this is this is bringing it all together really. So this is changing the um, the d spacing and the height all in one go, um, and they're able to to map out different positions on this this color chart to produce the uh, the structural color that, that they want by uh, using this this kind of biomimetic approach. All right, so um, I think these graphs really really tell a story. I mean, I think this is what what they've shown. They're able to to reproduce the the nano-scaled, nano-structured, so they're able to reproduce a nano-structured um, wings of a butterfly using this two-photon two lithography methodology. And then using that, they're able to vary the, the length scales of different parts of this, this bi-grating, these two gratings on top of each other, vary the size of the grating and vary the, the height of the grating. And when they do that, they're able to have a lot of control over the different colors that, that emerge from um, from that structure. The structural color, it, uh, they're able to produce uh, a very, very wide range of that. Um, so this is a really good example, I think, of um, biomimetic material, so copying nature, being inspired by nature, so seeing the way that nature solves a particular problem, how to make something colored, uh, and then using that approach. And as I said before, that approach can be used in many different areas of material science, materials chemistry, not just in color, but in terms of energy production. So using ideas from photosynthesis, um, self-healing self materials, self-cleaning materials. Uh, there's lots of examples where you can have um, uh, ideas from nature being translated into man-made materials. And I think this is a, a really good example of that. Okay, so let's have a look at the uh, conclusions. So as shown herein, uh, all visible colors can be obtained through the design and fabrication of bi-grating structures. To replicate nanoscale features of such bi-grating structures, we use two photon um, polymerization uh, due to outstanding spatial resolution and 3D structuring capability. Such bi-gratings um, are inspired by structural components found on the wings of the sea opus butterfly, which exhibits striking violet blue or violet or blue-green coloration when the period and height of the upper grating are approximately twice as large as those of the lower grating. Through both experiments and simulations, the dependency of structural color on a period and the height of the bi-gratings has been assessed. Uh, with bi-grating structures having a 2 to 1 period ratio and a 2 to 1 height ratio yielding enhancements in color purity due to the coupling of constructive interference and diffraction from multiple grating layers. Such an approach to structural color leverages structures found in living organisms and allows generation of bespoke colors with high vibrancy and high spatial resolution. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, a really nice summary and they, they've shown here um, an image reconstruction of high structural coloration. So the, I think this is the, uh, an original um, piece of art and they've managed to copy those, the colors found in that using their structural color methodology. Um, and do they say this, do they have the size? So this is one millimeter here. So this is on a very, very small scale. Uh, but you can see the number of color pixels that they have, have colored using this, this methodology here. Okay, so I think we're gonna 
uh, bring the stream to an end there. A little bit shorter than normal, but I think this is a, a paper that we could we could cover uh, very well. It had really central, clear idea. Uh, the methodology was um, hopefully quite easy to understand, and the results kind of spoke for themselves. That's what happens when you're you're doing color color science, color materials. You can just take photos and stuff, and that that uh, I think explains explains the materials as as well as spectra can do sometimes. Okay, so um, I hope you enjoyed that paper. I think it's a really, really interesting example of bio-inspired materials. As I said, uh, a really big field. And there's, there's lots of exciting work going on there. So thanks for being part of the stream. Um, if you enjoyed the stream, if you enjoyed the uh, discussion, make sure you don't miss out on, on any future streams by heading over to Twitch if you're not there already and uh, clicking the follow button on our, uh, on our channel. Uh, that will make sure that you are informed of uh, whenever we go live. You can also look at the schedule there to see what we have um, planned for the future future streams. You can also check out the Twitter feed. Uh, so the Twitter feed will um, tweet out the, the paper that's coming up uh, for discussion in future in the next stream. So you guys can have a read of it before or see if it's interesting to you before uh, you, you head, head over to the live stream itself. Also on uh, Twitch, you can look at some of the previous videos that have come out that's either the full streams or there's some highlights there you can look at as well uh, if you just want to take out bits that, that myself and, and other people as well you can make your own clips if you as part of the stream you think is particularly interesting you can clip that yourself uh, for other people to look at um, this the streams don't stay on twitch forever but they are all uploaded onto the youtube channel uh, which you can find a link down below as well so if you want to uh, have a look at some full streams uh, from longer ago than two weeks, I think, which is how long Twitch keeps them. Then, uh, then have a look at the YouTube channel, uh, which also hosts some of the some of the highlights on there as well. Okay, so that's it for uh, Journal Club on uh, this Friday afternoon, Friday evening. Hope you enjoyed it wherever you are, uh, and hope to catch you on the next stream. <laughs>